We're in our last uh, last day of the um, study on Holy Communion. And I hope this has been half as meaningful for you as it has been for me. It was a lot of work doing all the study, but I really enjoyed it and got a lot out of it. And I think hopefully we've all thought about it a little more in depth too. So today is the last day. What I told you we would work on is um, thinking about communion statements. Um, what is the best way to, to practice Holy Communion and still be faithful to all the things that we believe about it and that we've, we've said about it? So you're going to actually do some, some work. Does, does anybody need papers yet? Does anyone support you? Does anyone those? All right, so um, you should have four pages in front of you, and take a look at the, the first one, which should be, what are the prerequisites for a person to receive Holy Communion? Who should and should not be invited? Do you see that? So these are the theological requirements, right? After we studied it, these are the things that we said determine theologically who should take communion and who shouldn't. It's not just for everybody, it's for people that meet these requirements. So let's just review them. The first one is do they believe the words given and shed for you? If someone doesn't believe that, they, sh they shouldn't, shouldn't take it. The second one there, people who are um, not baptized should not take it. Baptism is the initiation into the Christian faith. That's the, that, that's the first thing you do. So someone coming up for communion should um, go and get baptized first if they're not, they're not baptized, right? Third, this is the big one. Um, people who are unable to examine themselves. So we saw in the scriptures how we're supposed to examine ourselves. So people who can't examine themselves, like little babies or, or even little, little children, or people who are mentally not cognitive to be able to examine, um, they would be uh, people who should, should not take communion. Fourth, this is the really big one. This is the biggest stickler of all, I think. Those who are of a different faith or confession. Because we saw in the Bible how taking communion means we all believe the same thing that is taught at this altar when we take it. So if someone comes up and takes it and they don't believe what's taught at that altar, there's there's a, a, a disconnect there. Can you be practicing another faith or confession? Say, say that for me again. Do you mean practicing another faith or confession? Um, I mean, they could be a believer in what they have, could have come to faith. Yes, so we, yeah, we when we studied that, we did look at it. If this is, I hope this is answering your question. But we're not saying that someone is not a Christian necessarily. They could, they might be a Christian, but do they believe the totality of what is taught at that altar? Do they believe everything that is taught at that altar? Well, otherwise, we're reducing it to a certain number of things saying, okay, as long as you believe this and this and this, it doesn't matter what the rest of it is. Do you remember? Oh, my links are gone. Remember my links? Right. <laughs> remember I had the chain links as a model to kind of right, illustrate right. what that's like? But I mean, Let's just say, um, because this came up with uh, uh, one of our pastors. He examined uh -huh. some people and found that they believed what he was teaching. Mm -hmm. And they had been going to his church for a significant period of time. So he, they totally, but they had not changed and they wanted communion. Yeah. And he examined them and they were not practicing the other faith and he allowed them in the Welsh Church to have communion. Can you hear that in the back? No. Um, so she's talking about a case in her a previous church she was part of, a, which was a Welsh Church, where the pastor examined some people that wanted to take communion, found that they believed exactly the same, but they weren't members. Um, it, just, just that, if I just give you that much of the scenario, the pastor has discretion. You think the pastor should let them commune? I, I, think, I think so. so. Yeah. yeah. See, head's nodding. Um, but there is a problem if if somebody believes the same as we do, but they 
don't want to become a member. You know what that's like? That's like dating a girl forever, but you don't want to get married, right? <laughs> it's a, at some point, you got to commit. commit, right? Um, so how, how could someone believe the same as we do, but for a long and indefinite period of time, um, they don't want to link themselves formally with us in, in membership? That would tell me there's a, there's a problem there that should be addressed at some point. Now, I... I don't know if the elders are going to, you know, if they find out all this stuff, I'm going to get myself in trouble. But I give communion, for example, to my um, my son-in-law and my father. Mm -hmm. They're not members, but I think that we believe the same way. And I think we're on a trajectory where eventually they're going to be members, you know. I don't know, Dad, if you're going to tell me someday to go fly a kite, then we better go talk, you know. <laughs> um, so I don't know, you know, how long does it take? I don't know, but I, it, you know, it can't just be indefinite forever. Does that make sense, Pastor Mark? I was going to say that, that we we spent a great deal of time talking at the seminary about pastoral discretion. Ah, you know, those situations. Yeah, we have this prescribed, but there's always can be exceptions, and so the pastor's got to use his discretion in certain situations. Yeah, and I'm grateful that that is our doctrine. That and, it, it, you know, and Dr. Engel said, boys, if, if you're going to sin, sin on the side of the law. Oh, I kind of like that. <laughs> <laughs> Who was that? Dr. Engel. He's in heaven now. Oh, okay. I don't know him. He was old back when I was 25. Wow. <laughs> so, oh, I like I'm that. he's not here anymore. Was it, did I answer the question? Yes. yes. Tim? I had a, a quick question. Um, Sorry. Uh, I think this applies to me um, as well as others, but uh, when you say a member, does that mean a member of this particular congregation or does it mean a member of the LCMS? Oh, that's a very good question. So what does that mean? Um, ultimately, we, we I think it means a member of the LCMS. Yeah, because if, if someone, they may not be part of this congregation, but if they go to a church that's in full fellowship, that confesses exactly the same thing that we do, how could I exclude them and say, well, you don't believe the same? Of course they believe the same. So um, that that's a good question. I, and I think we mean by that the whole LCMS. Okay. Okay, the fifth one here is those openly living contrary to God's word without repentance. So everybody who comes up for communion is a sinner. That's why we're coming, because we need, we need forgiveness, right? But if someone is openly sinning and not turning away from it, um, here, here's an example that happens on, all too frequently about a couple that's living together um, as husband and wife, but they're not husband and wife. At some point, you know, you got a pastor who really needs to sit down with them and Say, hey, boy, let's uh, let's get this in line with what the Bible teaches. And if they refuse, and they've had time to change, and they refuse, then at some point, would the pastor be um, vindicated to withhold communion from them? I th yes, I think so. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I I like what you said, though, Pastor Mars. They're on the side of love, so um, that's I guess that's where I've always practiced. But if you just are open and there's no standards or no requirements, right. then it doesn't mean anything anymore, does it? I, I was wondering if the emphasis needs to be made to those uh, people who are not LCMS and, and you know, whether to re-emphasize to them that we're not judging their faith. Yeah, that's Good. You know, did, I, did I put that in the second? That this has nothing to do with their faith, but it has to do with, you know. I should have put practice. that on the second page. I wish I had done that. Because I, I um, guess I, I found sometimes in, in doing that kind of thing. Right. I mean, we're, we're not really saying you're not a Christian. See, and they but, take it that way. Yes. You don't give an explanation. Yes. That's, that's really you good. You're saying I'm not a Christian. No, I'm not saying that. Right. That's really good. Uh, the sixth one here are those who refuse to forgive someone else or refuse to be reconciled to someone. So if somebody's living in, in um, open conflict with someone else, another Christian, and they're not 
seeking forgiveness or they won't give forgiveness to the other person, um, then once again, and they're not ready to come to the altar. Jesus said, you know, if you come to the altar and bring your gift and you realize that you hold something against, your neighbor holds something against you, go and make peace with your neighbor and then come back to the altar, right? So um, that's, that's a requirement. So those are the theological requirements. Now, if you go to the page that says considerations about how to frame invitations, these are not theological so much as they are practical. These are just things that I thought of out of my little pea brain um, to say, what's the best way, what are, what are better and not as good way, uh, ways to do this? Um, so how can we do it, first of all, in love? How can we do it in a manner least likely to cause needless offense? I think what Pastor Morris said could probably apply there, but I should have written it explicitly. How can we do it so that people don't feel like we're offending them? You can't help but offend some people with the truth. Right. Some people are going to be offended, but not, let's not have a needless offense, right? If someone comes to this church and they're like, I don't like that you preach this stuff about Jesus being the only way of salvation. I think you people are a bunch of bigots and, and, and evil folks. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> you know, but if they come in and we go, uh, Oh, you can't use that bathroom. We don't want you to. We don't. We don't want it to get messed up by people like you. That'd be that'd be terrible. <laughs> so let's not cause needless offense. Um, we don't want to do it in a way that will repel people from ever wanting to come again. So if they come and um, it, it's done in such a way that they never want to come back, then I think we've we. Hurt, we've hurt ourselves because they're not hearing that getting those extra chances to hear the gospel. Or they aren't listening to it. Yeah. You know, they... So um, I know there are some pastors that will not commune people <laughs> who come up to the altar. They'll stop at the altar oh, dear. and say, um, okay. Yeah, I, and we can't give communion to you because you're not whatever. Um, and they have to go back and sit down. Um, I would never do that. And. Um, Walther said not to do that. Walther said, if they come up, you, gotta, you don't give it to them, for goodness sakes. Because could you imagine the embarrassment of that and, and what they would feel? Would they ever want to come back again? That would be, that would be terrible. Um, another one is to do it in a way that's clear, even for people who have varied or even no background of the faith. So we're fine, and now that we're in a post-Christian culture, the chances that someone could come to our church who has knows nothing about Christianity, you read a statement like ours, that, that doesn't mean, it may as well put it in Chinese, you know, that's, you know, how, how do we help people understand something that we've spent three months studying and is actually somewhat complicated, right, how do we do it clearly? Um, the next one is without interrupting and infusing the divine service with lots of extra rubrics. So you know what rubrics are? The rubrics are the little notes in red in the hymnal that tell you like to sit down or stand up or kind of what to do. They're not part of the liturgy. They're just kind of directions. Um, so in the past, and I did that when I first came here, and I quit doing it, um, but verbally before giving communion to explain, okay, this is who should come, and this is why, and this... Um, and I still have to do that at the the service I do for the sailors over at Great Lakes because I've got, you know, out of like this last week we had 11 people come to the service, but only three were Lutheran, right? So I have to I have to explain to them. But that really interrupts the flow of the service, which is already on the long side, right? I'm trying to keep it short for you people <laughs> without cutting my sermons. Um, but you, you have that long explanation in there, and it's it's like a, it's a dead spot in the service. That's a killer. I don't. I don't. Is there a better way to do that? Well, plus two, you probably don't have to give it if you know there's no guests in the house. Right. And that. But then you also end up problem. You know, what if you have, um, like today we had several guests, but what if we had only one guest, mm -hmm. or if they, you know, they feel like I'm talking directly to them, you know, or I'm I'm talking to the crowd. But I, but I keep looking mm -hmm. at it. <laughs> that, 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 that's awkward too, isn't it? You don't come up here today. <laughs> yeah, you don't come up here. That's just how I felt. No, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> no, not at all. It's not Actually, it's good that you're here because you can give us 
good feedback that we don't often get. Well, I, somebody... um, I didn't come up because I wasn't sure and I didn't want to be, I guess, singled out or embarrassed or whatever. And out of respect for tradition or, you know. Um, so I didn't come up, but now that I'm hearing that maybe I, I could have or should have. Um, that's, that's it. I just, I didn't really, uh, I held back on it out of, uh, I wasn't really sure if I should. Yeah. Well, if, yeah. Let's, if you're not sure, you did the right thing. That's probably, that's probably the best. Okay. Um, and then the last one I wrote here is succinctly enough that people will actually pay attention to it. So I don't know if you got a chance to see this, Tim, but we have a, on the inside cover of the bulletin, there's like a big long statement there that we, we wrote. But you know what, there's stuff on like the back page. Of, how many pages is this thing, Nadine? This is like 15 pages long, right? Um, who actually sits down and reads all this stuff? <laughs> and especially, McTint came nice and early, but if you're visiting, have you ever visited another church before? What happens? You're racing around, the baby throws up, the kids are crying, you, you, you're usually, you're, you can pull, come to church, there's no parking spots left, and you're, so you're usually coming in the church like, you know, as the, as the first hymn is finishing up, and you're looking for it, and there's no seats except the ones right in the front, you know, you got to walk past everybody. They, they, they don't have time to read all that stuff. It's, uh, it's, it's, you just can't throw too much at them. Um, so the bottom line is, I think, between the theological requirements and the practical requirements, I don't think there's a good way to do this. I don't know that there's a perfect way to do this. But maybe there are better ways as compared to uh, worse ways. So here's what I'm going to do. The last two sheets of paper that you have are statements from other churches. And you'll notice not all of them are LCMS. So part of the reason I gave a selection here is just to get you to think, keep your, keep your minds active. But I'm going to do something I don't do very often, and that's divide you up into groups and ask you to just go through, pick one or two of these, and just go through them and um, evaluate them in light of the criteria that we have just looked at on these other two pieces of paper. Right? So um, I'll, I'll give you an example, I guess. Um, on one of the pages down at the very bottom, um, at the very bottom of that page, you see one from Mount Calvary Lutheran and ELCA Church. So in that one it says, Holy Communion, you are welcome to receive the sacrament if you believe that Jesus Christ is present in the bread and wine for the forgiveness of sins. Um, Children may come for a blessing. We do prefer that a person be baptized before receiving communion. So it's, it's very short, it's very succinct, but what's missing there? Well, pretty much five out of the six theological criteria are, are missing, right? Um, so evaluate these statements in terms of what we've just study and uh, we did that last week yeah we, we're going to do some more because we didn't have much time last okay. last time two weeks ago yeah two weeks ago <laughs> so this is our last chance yeah. to do it and then I want to pull you all back together um, for the last few minutes and um, see if any of you want to share some insights that you that, that arose out of your group okay so um, should I assign groups or can you break up into groups? Don't make sure no one's excluded. Just circle or circle the wagons around your table somewhere. Form little groups of maybe about three or four people. So we're gonna we're gonna resume as a class again here in just a moment. And what I'd uh, like to ask you to do. Um, anybody who would want to. Would you share something that for you was a, a highlight or a valuable point that emerged from the group discussion? So that, the group may not agree with you, but if, if somebody said something or you said something that you thought was just brilliant, <laughs> um, let, let's, uh, let's bring some of those to the fore. So Jim in the back. Much agree that um, we like the, the paragraph in the front kind of the way it's worded as far as it, it describes the dangers and, and that there's it's more than just making a decision, you know, 
not partake of or what have you. But we didn't like the location because nobody reads it in small print. Uh -huh. So we thought ideally it would be two things. To possibly put that paragraph where they're amended at all, or put it where the offering is. Right, because that's when people tend to talk a little in church. That's when they get to a point where there's a there's a pause where people are um, you know, where they're waiting for them to collect the offering. That gives you a chance to read it. And you can also put it in blue, not red, because those are Jesus' words. But like if you put it in a blue, and even though it might be one of those rubric things, um, it gives them a chance to read it and understand where we're at. And then possibly as a second, and your father came up with this, is um, it's another simple, sweet little uh, um, sentence. It says, who can take Holy Communion? You must be baptized and confirmed. Believe the body and blood of Jesus are present in the bread and wine, and be truly sorry for your sins. And then in parentheses it says, if in doubt, wait and speak with Pastor Oswald first. Now you could do the same blue and put that right at distribution. So now the two locations, the first one we have a chance at an offering to read a paragraph, and you're kind of more like instructed to because you're following the program of the bulletin in order. You get to the point where you're definitely going to read it once because it's in order in the service. And then when it's time to actually get up and stand up and go up or not, you're kind of reminded of it and saying, simple and sweet, you know, if you've been baptized and confirmed, come on up. If you believe it's the, the body and blood, like we believe. So okay. it was kind of and that's where we had the placement here in a while back, but then we that's decided to put it at the beginning, people would see it at the beginning. Of the yeah, story. I was going to say that. We Most kind of agreed to that. Most people don't read that. Right. Can you keep yeah. a copy of that for me, Jim? Yes, yes. yes. Exactly. Good. All right. Anybody, who else would like to share? Cheryl does. Cheryl does. <laughs> well, for me, simple nice and sweet. Uh, uh, the location is a great idea, but I think we should. Make put, a good turn. I think we. Should, I think we decided that uh, we should use bullet points. Uh, saying that the the six things that are really important with a short verse at the bottom of what we believe that's maybe in Corinthians. And then if you have any questions, please make an appointment with pastor during the week. So that was what we kind of, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna kind of add to that, that uh, if, you, you know, if you are not a member of an LCMS congregation, uh, please refrain from going today and make, an, and make the appointment with pastor during the week to sit down and talk about it first. Great. Uh, who, who else would like to share? Dave? I just don't want Jim to get the credit because Marie had all those ideas. <laughs> 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 yeah. Anybody else? Was that a helpful exercise to think through this and talk about it a little? Yeah, oh, sure. yeah. you gotcha. And then we're all kind of, we all know where we're at and why. Okay. I feel like maybe I should say something as the only aspiring, <laughs> aspiring new member, <laughs> maybe. Um, I know for me, it, it, it really much came down to um, making an appointment as the retired pastor said, with the pastor of the congregation, and I think we discussed that. Um, and then kind of going from there, um, as so, I'm very analytical and a planner, so I came in with the expectation of not going up and knowing that. And so I can't speak for others that, uh, you know, wouldn't do that as, as a, somebody new coming to the church. Mm -hmm. But... Um, I know for myself, it would, it, as, I'm sorry, what, Jim, Jim, Jim said, that the important thing would be to discuss it with the pastor, mm. you know, and um, but we didn't really have time to discuss anything, and I know that we mentioned that we'll talk during the week, um, but that, I think, as somebody new to the church, that would probably be the most important thing, because I, I think for me, that is... Um, you know, the most important thing is discussing things with you. Okay. Yes. I just thought, it, I like the idea of bullet points. These, these statements get too long and wordy. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, I think another thing to emphasize is that this is what we believe at home. This is what the LCMS 
believes about the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. So then you're, you know, they know it's the whole synod and not just the individual congregations. Right, and I think simplifying it, like he did his research, so he was, he came in knowing, you know, a good, you know, he was online, that's a good thing. Oh, you know, yeah, I'm going gonna, gonna to link yeah. for further instruction. Right, yeah. You will follow the link if it was written under there. If you need further information right. about this, go to blah, 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 blah that's whatever. Yeah. I probably would have, right. but I, I did That's before. a good I idea. Did too, so. Right, yeah. That's so, a really good yeah. idea. Yeah. So it's I feel like he. <laughs> <laughs> I think we were talking to Terry about having him. Terry just didn't show up yeah. because he had a bad week. He, he did his research. Yeah. 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 So yeah. that's a way of the future is putting things. I mean, you can always make a little bit more of an exclamation yeah. yeah. on our website. You can draw people to the website. Mm -hmm. To yeah, because, if they're I mean, embarrassed or don't, you know, don't. Understand. I mean, I don't see the numbers, and I don't know how you do it. How you tell how many people yeah. look. At the website, I'm sure there's a way that it's done, and you don't know what they're looking at on the website. But yeah, if you have that little caption or something in there on the website, maybe they know before they come. You know. We're not talking about the long process. All right, so it's, we're down to our very last minute. And I have to end on time because we've got four oaks. I have to shoot <laughs> out of here fast. Uh, I'll tell you where I came down on all of this. Maybe you're not interested, or maybe you'll be mad at me afterward, I don't know. And if you were not here a few weeks ago when we talked about um, the, 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 the notes on the service of, of communion, we talked about um, the liturgical renewal movement and how that influenced and shaped the practice of worship and, and Holy Communion. If you weren't here for that, a lot of what I'm going to say will make no sense to you. It's, it sounds like it's really coming from left field because... That was, I think that was a prerequisite. I was kind of greasing the skids there a little bit. But one of the things that I, I, we saw that week was the frequency of communion, how the emphasis on that has changed in the last 40 or 50 years and why. Um, so I go back to the statement by um, Pieper that without a system for announcing, you can't <coughs> really have close communion. In the final analysis, no matter how we do this, in, in the end, unless people are announcing it's not close communion, people are still being asked to make decisions for themselves at some, at some level, at some point. So what I would do is go back to communion four or six times a year, not a, especially not on Easter or Christmas when you've got all kinds of guests, but a certain number of times a year, let people know well in advance and you get a ticket from me before, before we have communion. Um, that gives me a chance to scrutinize all of these things, and, and I can do that at whatever level is appropriate for me. So like George, who I talk to you know, multiple times a week, George says, oh, Nadine and I are going to commune Sunday. Gotcha, George, here's your ticket. But we got members <laughs> of the church here who haven't been here for a year, and if they wanted to take communion, I would need to, we'd need to meet together so I can make sure that you understand what this is about and what we're, what we're, what we're covering. Um, and then you've got, it's very simple. When we have the service, I, all I have to do is announce, you know, we, our system for taking communion requires people to declare beforehand that they're gonna do it and they have a ticket. So someone that's a new person, that, oh, okay, well, that's, I don't have a ticket because I wasn't here. That's, you don't feel excluded or anything or shut out because that's, uh, that's just the way it's, the way it's done there. I need you to go real fast because I'm going to leave. Yeah. So this is my fault that we're going over. Uh, where I was confirmed in the congregation that I belong to in Texas, uh, they would write, fill out pre-communion cards the week ahead. Oh, the week ahead. Yeah. And, and put them in and... That was their way of yeah. announcing that they were going to be there. Well, part of the challenge with something like that for me is that requires me to scrutinize every person every week, which I can't do. Oh, come on. Yeah. <laughs> but to do it four or six times a year, that I think would, might be possible. So I don't, I don't see us going to that. I think we're just too embedded in what we've been doing. Or we're not going to change. Well, the difficulty but, would be is if it got out and ignorant people thought that, oh, you got to get a ticket to go to communion over at To go to church. Yeah. 
you, you know, the pastor, they may wrongly think that the pastor sells tickets. Oh. <laughs> that would be easy to address. All right, thank you, Lord, for our opportunity, time to have been together these last few months studying this, this uh, issue. Continue, Lord, to shape our hearts and our minds, our, our thinking and our attitudes by your holy and precious word. Amen.